Willkommen zum Journeys Podcast. Schön, dass du dabei bist. Mein Name ist Alexander Faubel und regelmäßig bekommt ihr hier inspirierende Menschen und Stories präsentiert, die euch dabei helfen können, euer eigenes Potenzial zu erkennen. Im Dialog beschäftigen wir uns mit der Frage, welchen Einfluss Psychedelics auf dem Weg zur Selbsterkenntnis und inneren Heilung spielen. Wir teilen Erfahrungen und stellen sowohl traditionelle als auch moderne Mental Health Tools vor, die dich auf deinem Weg begleiten können, das Leben zu führen, wonach sich dein Herz sehnt. Und nun wünsche ich dir eine wunderbare Zeit, wertvolle Impulse and let the journey begin. Im heutigen Gespräch dreht sich alles um das Thema Schmerz und Leid. Hierzu hatte ich die Möglichkeit, ein englisches Interview mit Jack Ryan zu führen, der ebenfalls Teilnehmer meines Ayahuasca-Retreats in 2019 war und sich schon sehr lange gezwungenermaßen mit diesem Thema in seinem eigenen Leben auseinandersetzen musste. Jack leidet schon sehr lange unter chronischer Müdigkeit, die zur größten Belastung in seinem Leben zählt. Aufgrund dessen hat er einen Weg für sich gesucht, mit dem damit einhergehenden Schmerz besser umzugehen und hat jahrelang diverse spirituelle Praktiken aufgesucht, und unter anderem in Indien versucht, von buddhistischen Lehrmeistern so viel wie möglich über unser Bewusstsein zu lernen. Er erklärt uns, wie er es als selbsternannter Master of Suffering geschafft hat, eine bessere Beziehung im Umgang mit seinem Leiden zu finden und wieso wir unser Ego als Freund und nicht als Feind sehen sollten, um ein erfülltes und glückliches Leben zu führen. Besonders spannend war für mich ebenfalls das Thema Spiritual Bypassing, das heißt die Tendenz von vielen Menschen in spirituellen Kreisen, Spiritualität einfach als weitere Identifikation des Egos zu nutzen, um ungelösten emotionalen Problemen und psychologischen Wunden im Hier und Jetzt zu entfliehen. Ob Ayahuasca ihm helfen konnte, mit seiner chronischen Krankheit umzugehen und wie es sich für ihn angefühlt hat, riesige Schlangen aus seinem Mund zu übergeben, verrät er uns ebenfalls. Jack wird uns am Anfang der Folge durch eine siebenminütige geführte Meditation leiten als Einstieg, die ihr bitte nicht beim Autofahren mitmacht. Wie jede Woche auch hier wieder viel Spaß beim Zuhören, beim Lernen und bis zum nächsten Mal. Ich freue mich, wenn ihr den Podcast mit Freunden teilt und wenn ihr jemanden kennt, den ich ebenfalls interviewen sollte, meldet euch sehr gern bei mir. Bis zur nächsten Woche. Ciao, ciao. So, if it's okay, Alex, I'd like to start with a meditation. I think yes. it would be really a beautiful place to receive what we speak about. And I think it would be a wonderful invitation for anyone listening to experience the content of the podcast from a deeper experience of themselves. And so um, if we could just maybe just close our eyes. And just begin to relax the body. Just bring our attention to anywhere that feels a little bit tight or unrelaxed. And just bring our loving awareness to that space. And just allow it to relax. Just bring our attention to the breath. Breathing in through the nose. Just allow that to take us into a deeper awareness of ourselves. And we breathe out through the nose. And we let go of our stories and ideas about ourselves. Breathing in. Coming into a more intimate experience of ourselves and breathing out, letting go of our day and our stories of the day. Breathing in, you start to feel that you are more intimate with a knowing of yourself. And bring your attention to that knowing. Bring your attention to the 
deepest experience of yourself, to that experience that is always there, that is not flavored by the personality, that is not obscured by the mind. And just in bringing your attention to that, just allow it to blossom and allow it to expand and keep relaxing, softening. And keep allowing your breath to guide you back into that place until the experience of the world starts to dissolve and loosen its attention on us. And this is a deeper experience of being you. Just keep bringing your attention back to this, this primordial I, this deep, true essence of yourself, beyond the names and the labels and the ideas and the experiences. Keep coming back to it. And the more we cultivate this beautiful, limitless, ever-present awareness, the more we are aware of it in our everyday life, and the more that it is brought into the way that we live, and the more that we navigate all our engaging and all our connections through And over time, this will begin to bless your experiences. And the tenderness and the intimacy of yourself, you begin to realize, is entirely what your experience of the world is made up of. And the more intimate you are with yourself, the more intimate you are with life. And that is perhaps the greatest journey known to humanity, is the deep, intimate recognition of the deepest aspects, aspects of being And as you relax your attention to this practice, it is always here, always now. And it is always something we can turn to, to root us in a sense of well-being and a sense of connection. And so as we start the podcast, don't allow the mind to become overly active. Maintain some rooting in this beautiful, ever-present stillness that is quite simply alive. And your experience of everything will be so much richer.
Mm. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> That's beautiful. What a start. <laughs> <laughs> so how does pain come into this equation? The pain is the messenger of love. It's bringing us back to our self-love. Mm. And uh, it's <laughs> there's a bumpy road sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can talk about bumpy roads. I know you can, and uh, that's actually a good a good thing. I remember that next to that I adore your laughter, which is the funniest thing in the world. Uh, please never stop laughing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I remember your your especially your face and the way you looked after. The ceremonies when we met at that Maloka thing. The, the dining hall, yeah. The dining hall thing. And then we just laid in the, the, the corner and the hammer go like on that couch thing. And then I looked at you and your face had everything. <laughs> you didn't have to say <laughs> anything. It was like, he is done for tonight, right? Um, oh, I watched my videos, my video diaries from um, the jungle today. And I can't believe how beaten up I was from it by it. I was the after the first ceremony, especially it got better and better. But after the first ceremony, I was absolutely in pieces. I really <laughs> was completely spent. Well, I could see, I could read it from your face, but what is it? You went in there without any previous experience of any psychedelic, no drug, right? That that is it. No, yeah, just I've smoked a couple of joints before, but nothing, nothing other than that. That's pretty, pretty virgin-like. So you went in and then <laughs> what was your, we didn't talk about that yet. What was your expectation before you went in there and wh where did you hear about this whole thing? I, um, it was completely off my radar until I was in Florida, I think. So I'd, I, I basically was going to India for the winter or somewhere around India, Thailand, India. Um, but I was coming over to meet up with Jen. We last met five years ago, so it's been quite a while. And um, and when I were headed over to the Science and Non-Duality Conference in California, in fact, we both headed over there for a week after we'd holidayed down in Florida. I was in San Francisco on my own. She'd already headed back to Florida and I decided to come back to Florida. And at some point over that, time which was this was october possibly into november early november i watched a video on youtube from dr gabal mate mm. and he was uh, during the video i don't know when it was recorded but he was in the temple and he was talking about how completely flawed he'd been by the experience and how he was meant to be hosting uh, the retreat and in the end the guys from the the temple took him under their wing and uh, nurtured him and um, supported him in his own struggles. And I think I really valued his insight from the videos I've seen of him before. I haven't watched a load. And to hear him talk so profoundly and so uh, humbly about ayahuasca, it really spoke to me. And in that moment, uh, destiny was changed or <laughs> destiny was, was revealed. And I went on the website, booked a place. It was fully booked. And so I was on the reserve list. And I, I said, OK, I'm going down to Peru anyway, because I could then come back to Florida. And my plan was to spend more time with Jen. And as I landed in Lima Airport, literally turned my phone on. And I had an email from the temple saying that there's been a cancellation in your invited to apply for the position for, for the place that's available and so you did. <laughs> i was yeah and so i actually got a confirmation back before i got through customs so before i actually landed officially in peruvian and soil i had my place <laughs> i think it must have been about th uh, two weeks later so i went i was heading down to Cusco. i spent a week in lima and then i was heading down to Cusco and then machu picchu and then um, it was pretty much the time to go up to the jungle after that Wow, I remember. So that. yeah, it was. It felt very destined. So what was it in that video of Gabor? Because 
I watched the exact same video, which made me go there. But what was the reason? Did why it? you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I watched. I, I think it was linked on the, their website, and I yeah, went through the reviews, and then I looked at his, and I was like, okay, now I'm going. Well, the reason that it attracted me, and I can't remember what the process was, but the reason that I was going, my expectation was to was to deal with the remnants of my fatigue that I'd been experiencing for 10 years or so. Um, and I'd worked through it in many different ways, very consciously, and, um, and got to the point where I was living a relatively full life. Um, I would still have the effects of doing too much. I would still have struggles of working every day. So it was, I, it was limiting, but much, much better than it had been. And I just felt as though I, I don't remember what told me this or why I thought it, but I just had a sense of knowing that the energy that was stagnant, the the blocks that I had experienced, that I was experiencing, which I think came back to childhood and my birth, were out of my conscious reach. So I, I needed to do something that was able to work beyond my own reach and that's what I was thinking when I signed up to do my first <laughs> psychedelic retreat well, how bold of you but you were to have oh, naive I think naive maybe as well how, but to have this awareness you must have worked I know you you went to India a lot you, you spent a lot of time in meditation and potentially other practices so what did you do beforehand to to get to that awareness that, that the fatigue might be some energy that's stagnant coming from childhood or birth even? Um, well, I, I think the initial thing is that if you s suffer from serious limiting fatigue, you reach a, a place that changes your life. And you start to, to navigate life through, you, you either suffer and fall down this abyss or you start to work your way back out of it and you start to look at the things and look at the way that you experience life and the emotional consequences of your actions and your, your thoughts and your behaviours. Um, but I, I think ultimately, actually, to be honest, I think my spiritual awakening came before my fatigue i think fatigue can sometimes be a consequence of the spiritual awakening mm. to the point that your body almost can't process the energetic shift that happens when you awaken when you open up to more of yourself mm. and I, I think it's not uncommon i've, I've met a few people that uh, in my early days of uh, spiritual retreats that were also battling or um trying to balance their life with a, a limitation on their, their energy levels. And uh, over time, uh, yes, I went to India. I, I initially did a lot of work in Glastonbury in the UK. And my consciousness was, appeared to be from a place of quite unconscious. <laughs> uh, I would almost say from my, I wouldn't use this term for, for described anyone else but from my point of view I was probably quite ignorant of the true nature of life and the fundamentals of life and so I came from a quite a materialistic commercialistic background and so there was a quite it felt as though it was a fast track from such a, an unaware place to quite a speedy transition into something more conscious And so I did a lot of work. I, did, I meditated twice a day. I did a lot of mental practices that allowed me to um, develop skills to um, soften and to accept love. And some, some strange things like cold showers um, and starting to learn to be okay in that coldness. I would develop in a balance by riding my bike with no handed as for the whole way to work <laughs> mm -hmm. and I would spend a lot of time in nature I would um, just slowly meditatively walk through nature and and slowly my 
more dominant experience was became silence became quietness and in that quietness my my attention to that quietness my awareness of it rarely shifted and so you start to navigate life with a much more peaceful contented mindful perspective uh yeah it really just transformed my experience of myself um and in time although the uh, effects of the fatigue perhaps at some point worsened after that even that was a beautiful invitation to surrender and to let go and because to be honest it got to the point where i literally was pretty much bedridden mm -hmm. and the only way that was going to be okay was to accept it as it was and in that extreme limitation where i would get up have something to eat go back to bed <laughs> there was an absolute freedom, a freedom that I'd never um, experienced before. Through that um, acceptance. Yeah, it, it, was, it was, to me, it seemed like a, an involuntary acceptance because I was either going to suffer or I was going to open up to what was. And in that opening, in that acceptance, um, there, was, there was a freedom, there was a peace. Um, and that peace was... A beautiful sense of self-love wow that's so interesting is that is there a way you can describe when that light switch got turned on is there some like was this one special moment or did it happen gradually like how did that happen well this was probably about six years seven years ago maybe Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it, if I explain where it, how it developed, I think a little bit that might, and then I'll lead on to mm -hmm. answer your question. So I got divorced in 2001. And from that point onwards, the divorce really rocked me to the bottom of my psyche, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And it became really 10 years of suffering. I think I probably wasn't mentally happy before that point, but I was very energetic. I was very um, ambitious in various different things. And so I was good at distracting myself, I suppose. Mm -hmm. and, and then when the divorce happened, it, um, it really cracked my world, my safety, my safety net. And, um, and I suppose I spent 10 years living on the edge of that suffering. Mm -hmm. and it didn't take much for it to come back. So I, I think I did everything I could to try and avoid it. And so I got very heavily involved in um, love, in relationships. I, I, um, I went from one relationship to another. And my well-being was so fragile that it would just take one hiccup in my life for everything to come crumbling down again. And and so I, I think I there was a long road to get to the point where one day in my house, realizing that I was my life was this. I I couldn't work, I couldn't do anything for more than five minutes and then have to go back to bed. And I would literally be sleeping most of the day. And so it got to the point when I was fed up with suffering. Mm -hmm. And there there's there's just a Often in life, there's this switch where your experience, your circumstances, your reality is no longer okay. And I don't think you can get there without getting to the end of that journey. Mm. So for me, my journey was pretty, pretty stressful and pretty brutal at times. But I, I think it really, uh, I certainly look back and see that it served me so beautifully to be able to come out of all of that that limited me well in hindsight we always do feel that normally we should right? yeah <laughs> yeah well yeah you'd hope so wouldn't you because you you hope you hope to be in a better place but <laughs> yeah. uh during it's definitely doesn't feel like that but 10 years of fatigue and suffering and all of this ups and downs and going from one relationship to the other and distracting yourself and then realizing just one little thing could just you know one hiccup that could just force you to break down again 
all of this and then divorce and those 10 years of, let's call it suffering with all of your previous knowledge on material world, you call it, you were pretty ignorant of the fundamentals of life, right? You had a pretty materialistic background and view on things. And if I remember correctly, you, you were running a successful insurance business as well. Yes. Yeah, I was. Uh, I, one of my partners, I, my relationships were fairly, I had a couple of seven year relationships, so they weren't, it wasn't quite as dramatic as I may have painted, <laughs> but, but also I traveled a lot in those relationships. They weren't always healthy. And one of my partners I met and she was on the spiritual path and it felt a little bit like there was this, and I don't probably wouldn't talk like that now, like this now, but I think from in it and at the time, I would say that there was almost this um, written agreement that we would meet and she would be the catalyst for my awakening. And so when we met something, a recognition was there and I'd been internet dating just leading up to it and that's how we met. And then I'd had enough of it. I'd reached my, my limit of dating. I hadn't been doing it for long, but I'd gone a bit mad with it and in that moment it I reached a point realizing this wasn't the way and that's when I met her through an internet date but it was the last one I was ever going to go on and have ever been on since <laughs> <laughs> yeah and our, our relationship was very educational and she took on a role of teaching and and I kind of felt as though what she was telling me I knew but I, I wasn't conscious of mm -hmm. and so everything that was happening in the relationship was uh, again before I started to follow a spiritual community in Glastonbury was it felt as though it was an acceleration like I'd been um, unaware for so long in my life that there was a catch-up process going on mm. and I tend to be quite obsessive with things historically and so my new baby, my new <laughs> prize toy was spirituality. And so, uh, yeah, I, I was in it both feet. And, uh, yeah, I was living every moment through a growing and a nurturing of new ideas and new concepts. And so that relationship came to an end. It was quite a dramatic relationship in terms of emotions. We, I think we both gave everything we had. And in that we probably both reached a point of realizing that we were healthier and happier not together, even though it was, it was a, a quite a, a strong connection as well. Mm -hmm. And so that was the beginning of the end of my suffering. The coming out of that relationship was probably two years before I then got to the point where I had suffered enough. And my capacity to suffer was clearly <laughs> very, very nearly inexhaustible. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, I really just reached my limit. And my limit was, was um, yeah, was were very flexible. <laughs> and so uh, I think I traveled a lot through that process. And that served me tremendously in realizing and understanding my mind and realizing the the limitations that it imposes and the unreal reality that it creates and how we um, suffer because of it hmm. so this whole idea of altered states of consciousness or the whole concept of non-duality non-dualism all of those spiritual terms those started then to come up in your life and you were, like you said, both feet in, started to dig deeper into all of those new concepts and ideas. And those then fast forward led you to Iquitos at one point. Um, um, yeah, it, it, didn't, it didn't become a non-dual thing for quite a while. My early spiritual experience didn't even use the term non-duality. Um, and I'm not keen on Uh, labels because I think they um, they create a spiritual identity very easily but um, yeah it 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 became I went to India if I can just explain some of this this is interesting I think I went to in I, I went on a Vipassana retreat in the UK 
that was after I've left the spiritual community that I was in. And the Vipassana retreat was really quite amazing. I'd be meditating a lot anyway, but I'd reached a point at the end of the retreat is a 10 day silent retreat where you meditate for a big part of the day, at least an hour at a time. And you sit without moving and it's quite torturous <laughs> until you come through the other side and it starts to become very blissful and peaceful. And I remember coming to the end of that retreat and really feeling like the people around me were on their phones talking to uh, loved ones and just saying, oh, you never guess what I've done. <laughs> and I just had to escape all of that noise and that chatter and that mental activity. And I just really I went up to the top field where I was, where the retreat was setting beautiful part of the UK, uh, really rural and picturesque. And I just sat up there for as long as we were allowed to sit up there for the rest of the day. And, and just really completely and utterly honoured the silence that I was um, aware of, that the silence, that the chatter of my mind had been obscuring all my life. And in that moment, the silence was, was truly acknowledged as something always here, never not here, but often obscured by the mind. So I met a guy on the end of the course uh, who had just been to Tiruvannamalai, which is a town in southern India. And I'd actually connected the dots because before I went into the retreat, I'd started to become aware of uh, an Indian guru from the 19, early 19th century or early 20th century, sorry, called Ramana Maharshi, who is probably the sat guru, the main guru of all non-dual teachings. Um, the very few people that don't come through his his influence in some way. And I remember thinking he lived in a, a small town called Tiruvannamalai, and uh, the town was famous for a really amazing temple, one of the biggest in India, and also for uh, a, a sacred mountain called Aranachala, which is a mountain that is meant to be, and I, I use this lightly, but in terms of Indian beliefs, it's meant to be Shiva reincarnated. And I was actually much more interested in the mountain. I heard, I uh, watched a video about the mountain being a nine mile radius and people walk around there to gain enlightenment. And I was, I felt as though I was on the cusp of something. I, my awareness and my reality had shifted unrecognizably from where I was probably a year before. And I was, um, I could taste something fundamentally beautiful that I was, I was touching, but it was coming and going. And so it felt as though our actual was talking to me and I felt inspired to go there. So I went to India. I spent uh, a few months in India, but two weeks in Tiruvannamalai at his ashram, which is still uh, inviting a huge number of Western uh, pilgrims. I certainly came back from India, very different again very much rooted more in my sense of myself and that rooting was very um unshakable it, it started to become it started to bless the whole of of existence or the whole of my experience of life mm -hmm. um and it was about three months later i sat on my bed at home i think i was reading his book that had been written by david godman uh called be as you are, I think it is. And something just clicked. And I kind of had a, a, a flavour of him being there talking to me. Um, and I describe that lightly, but it felt very real at the time. And it, I, I went beyond and knew myself beyond the concept of time. Mm. And I think that's probably the biggest shift that has occurred in the last 10 years and that, um, that has never left me, that shift of realising that, that the truth of what I am, the awareness that is ever-present, that is the, the real essence of myself in which all other aspects and all other expressions of myself uh, appear, is before and prior to time. 
Um, and that was, I suppose, the biggest shift. And so leading on to Iquitos, uh, a big jump, it was probably about five years. But mm. um, so I was living in this state of deep self-awareness, but there was still a physical limitation. And so I was, I felt, I felt as though I knew what it was, but it wasn't something that I could access or uh, release or work with. It felt as though, and there were I'm sure there were many other modalities that I could have chosen, but. Mm. Sure, sure, <laughs> right <agree> right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I went for the hard stuff. <laughs> So I was very naive going into the jungle. I, I love to talk about some of my naivety. If yes, you like. <laughs> please, please. But I guess a lot of us went in there with uh, a different idea of what actually happened then. But yeah. especially a couple of people, and I still bow before you, is a couple of you guys went in there without any previous psychedelic experience. And for me, the journey towards the temple started like, I don't know, five years ago when I, I t told myself for the first time, I'm going to do this at one point, whenever it fits and I'm called. And then all of the succeeding uh, experiences that I had with several other psychedelic substances led to that experience eventually end of last year. But if I hadn't had those before, I wouldn't would have made a jump. So I don't know what, what made you guys do this, but I couldn't have done it. So yeah, chapeau. Yeah, I, I think um, <laughs> had I known, then it would have been very different. I don't think I would have put myself through it. I, I think the biggest struggle for me, the ceremonies were tough. I found that uh, having been uh, living in a real state of calm and and stability, yeah, the unexpected nature of ayahuasca and the, the losing of control really really challenged me but but also the biggest thing was i had a really a really clever and precise regime to give me optimum health and everything leading up to ayahuasca changed that so i was not eating what i would normally eat i wasn't eating as much as i would normally eat yeah. and i wasn't going to be able to sleep very much during the early part of the retreat And all of those were major, major fears that I wouldn't have been willing to let go of mm -hmm. had I not been put in that situation where it was expected and required to do. So those were um, reluctant changes that actually have made a huge difference. And I think some of it is just coming out of my comfort zone and learning to be different in it. And the ayahuasca aspect of it Uh, was perhaps the tool that gave me that opportunity. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I don't know whether it in itself provided any massive shifts. I did feel very energized at the end of the retreat. I've watched the, the diaries, the video diaries that I did at the time and noticeably became more energized from a very low point at the beginning of it, I must say. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it just, it. I think with something like for anything chronic where it becomes very much rooted in your experience it's very hard to shift yourself out of it because yeah. you're your it's so your go-to right? experience yeah, it is yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah it's it's ingrained in your experience and and with i can speak personally about fatigue with fatigue you if you start to feel tired it, be, it comes with added energy it comes with a, la a lack of energy it comes with a story And that story creates a very familiar and predictable experience. And you start to live out the ideas about yourself in those experiences. And to shift out of that is incredibly difficult because it's so much a part of what you expect to happen in life. Mm -hmm. But it takes something as challenging as for me as an ayahuasca retreat for me to realize that actually even if I go to the depth of my energy levels and I feel utterly and utterly drained and exhausted, then that's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. I can still be myself in that. And it was almost about learning to suffer consciously without it impacting my well-being. 
and yeah i think that's what i got from the retreat as much as anything was the capacity to go beyond my my current limitations my physical current limitations well i said you're so when you said you went in you you came from a really peaceful mental state and you said the yeah physical, the physical <laughs> limitation was the only thing that that kept you on you know, having this full experience of everything is is perfectly in harmony you went in. yeah that was the expectation right you went in with that okay yes some, some sort of relief on the physical realm i suppose um, yeah I, i think i was okay with it in terms of coping mm -hmm. but um i think it's easy to kid yourself that you're okay with it on other levels and so i, I come from a sporting background i've always been quite athletic in my life and so to not have that capacity took away a big part of me and that served its purpose in many ways to be to go beyond my sense of identity or my limitations of identity but it but it yeah if i'm honest it was there was also a part of me that was tortured by it because i really wanted to be able to go for a walk and not feel like i need to go to bed for two days afterwards mm -hmm. so i'd gone past that point when it came to the jungle but yes that that's i wanted to be able to live a fully healthy embodied life And that, that was my main drive. If you say that the main part you took out of it was basically being able to suffer consciously without kind of impacting your well-being, was there something shown to you that helped you understand the root cause of that fatigue? You said it might have come from childhood trauma or birth even? Not during the ceremony. I think I already knew. I, I was born with a cord around my neck. And so I've, I think it created a, a quite a traumatic Uh, relationship with breath and I think while I was active and exercising I was able to avoid the consequences of that because I was living a healthy and my body was working to its maximum but when I started to do that to excess and started to train for triathlons um, like 20 hours a week then eventually and I was running my business and I was in a stressful relationship so everything was kind of getting on top of me And I just reached my ceiling and uh, I kind of had a meltdown, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And part of that meltdown was to um, awaken to something else in me. But I think that one thing about being able to live with your suffering consciously is that within time, as you're applying that conscious awareness of something, it does begin to shift. You're not, you're not fueling it. You're not identified by it. You're not being defined by it as much and and so when the energy stops going to it to the same degree that that a sufferer or a victim of chronic something lives in then it does start to release itself and it does start to work through and over time it's not just about living being able to live with your suffering it's about that suffering being Healed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the healing starts to uh, integrate what what the the our suffering in life is is what is what feels disconnected and separate from love, and so when you start to love it and allow it, as you say, then it yeah it starts to uh, transform and trans transcend its own limitations, and it starts to become part of the beauty of life and flow more freely and and go beyond its own limitations well eventually one could say that all suffering in life is just attachment but attachment to anything if you're talk, talking about chronic diseases in your case fatigue could you explain i mean and then looking at all of your previous experiences of meditation deep meditative practices and other other modalities but the way you perceive suffering now and what helps you with all of the yeah. knowledge that you get gathered like to to cope with it because a lot of people me including this year i guess went through a lot of suffering and a, a way to kind of frame it differently for people to to I don't, make a make a first step maybe in that direction of being able to to create a more balanced relationship with suffering maybe yeah sure i'm i'm a master of suffering <laughs> <laughs> 
um so yes yeah it's it is it is um it isn't easy um suffering is a big part of a lot of people's lives and let me just sorry i'm just gonna spend a, a second just to uh, allow your question to land so i can mm, speak from there mm -hmm. feel the pain <laughs> <laughs> So, oh, I've lost my train of thought. Can you just ask the question again? Yes, like uh, the the way you would explain for, to someone your relationship to suffering, how that evolved now, and how that helps you now cope with it. Like, you know, just this is just a concept. The idea of suffering is just it's not me. It's something that I'm attached to and I, I want to let go. Yeah. Of it. So, you know, I find a way to perceive it differently. Like what is your current approach to suffering then? I think attachment is part of the equation. I don't think it explains and resolves everything. So I think there is a degree of suffering in life. I think if you live your life fully, it's very easy in spiritual circles to become aloof and removed from suffering. Um, but you live in a non-dual trance almost where the ego starts to avoid living, avoid being embodied. Mm -hmm. And so you start to live in this fa airy fairy world of spirituality and you, uh, you very masterfully um, and skillfully avoid suffering by um, becoming the nothing. I am um, just my awareness. I'm not my suffering. And so I don't think you can escape suffering. I think you really need to face it and you need to live it. And you need to allow the mind to, first of all, I think it's about finding the stillness within your mind, realizing that between each thought, between each nervous activity, between each judgment, there is a, a silence, an absolute pristine stillness that is the backdrop to your mind and in which all of those activities appear. And, and the more you bring your attention to that, it's there. You can't deny it. It is so every, between every word. If we slow the words down, there is a clear gap between what's happening and that gap is absolute pristine stillness and when you're able to make that more of your experience and realize that it's still there when things are happening in your life then you your capacity the mind's capacity to allow suffering goes through the roof and you start to redefine your relationship with suffering and that's the key i think if you're always trying to avoid suffering by some spiritual practice or some new identity that is beyond the, the suffering, then I, I think you're always probably one step away having that false identity that you've created to avoid it, having it ripped from under your feet and you're right back down in your suffering again. Mm -hmm. So some of the practices I used to do about the cold shower, it's all about building a capacity to surrender to allow whatever's showing up for you whether it's what you think should be in your life or not and and that capacity probably requires a degree of meditation to get to that point so you can you can kind of separate yourself from it to some degree but once you've got that awareness of it and you're not necessarily quite so sucked into it then you can you have the the possibility the option the invitation to be in it but not be entirely identified. misshaped and yeah and identified by it it's it's a very subtle balance between not becoming consumed by this suffering because I think there's always suffering in life. I've recently finished a relationship that I was in, or we relationship has finished. And it was incredibly painful and a 
deep sense of loss. And I, I think when you love somebody and when you, you commit to somebody and you make them, uh, you hope that they will be part of your life going forward. And those are beautiful human qualities and beautiful human experiences and emotions. But when it comes to an end, all of those commitments that you've made need to unravel. And that's painful because you are losing a deep part of the love that's reflected back to you in the world. But it isn't, so you, I don't think you'll ever be free of suffering. I think that's a, a really, Illusion. yeah, a really unhelpful understand, um, idea about spirituality and one that I know very well. And I lived in that state of denying suffering for probably three years where I was literally in this, moved sense of myself and nothing touched me but it wasn't good for my relationships in terms of all family relationships and and love relationships and it wasn't good for my being part of the world and so you do you can never escape your suffering you need to face it at some point <laughs> yes. it's got your name on it <laughs> <laughs> you want to date you yes let's go yeah, absolutely tangle. Um, it wants to become very intimate with you <laughs> <laughs> oh boy and it does well with that yeah so this idea of spiritual bypassing right to just glorify now the spiritual path that one is on and this i'm on a path of enlightening now i understand my full authentic truth and i'm walking this path all other humans around me are so unconscious like who yes. are they to know and talk to me even right and then you're in this bubble of spiritual people that all think they got it figured out and they forget uh, that the real lessons to be learned is living on this earth as a human being going through all of this what we call pain suffering and the other beautiful experiences we can right through all the emotions that we can feel and yeah that, that's where the, where the real work is and to be honest i think your spiritual practice really only starts once you come out of your your ideas of spirit about spirituality and about enlightenment and only when you give up on the holy grail yes do you really start to live your authentic brave honest and real life with the focus on the day by day the ups and yeah. downs the the fears Be the worries the pain the love the whole the whole spectrum of of everything that we call existence right yeah can you still love what you don't want in your life Mm -hmm. um, yeah can you can you embrace it can you stand in the fire and still be open can you still be willing to love life when it's really kicking you <laughs> yes and uh it's funny i think ayahuasca I, treats you that as, as, yeah, I just wanted teaches to, you that a lot so just wanted to make that that point there's a cool meme that i remember which is kind of a a person standing on a cliff and there's a huge massive hand that kicks that person in the butt and yeah. it says ayahuasca with the, the hand that kicks the person and then there's another hand that catches it the person down on the bottom of the rock also saying ayahuasca so it's kind of this i kick you in the butt but i love you and you're safe and this yeah this was exactly my experience <laughs> those two weeks so the idea that i got taught there is this whole acceptance of everything that is the way it is it's perfect right the painful lessons that that had to be there for you to learn grow change and become the version of yourself that you are in this moment and this will continue forever until the day you die and leave this plane and it is beautiful the way it is but my question to you since you're the master of suffering <laughs> but what a title um absolutely is, yeah is um <laughs> and i've struggled this year a lot with that actually myself is this this balance that you mentioned of, you know, not being consumed by the suffering and balancing out on the other spectrum where you focus on gratitude and positivity and affirmations. And I'm, I'm determined to create my own life and I'm, I'm going, I'm finally walking on my path and doing all of those things. So the question to you then is what is the, is there a right percentage? Is there a, you know, the right way to do it or, or wrong way to do it. For me personally, I feel 
if I'm in a state where I'm really, I'm, I'm like you in that sense, I tackle everything head on. And if I feel, okay, there's pain coming and suffering that I'm all, then I'm all in. I'm like, all right, show me. And not just in the temple in ayahuasca where I asked basically, show me my biggest fear. And people were like, are you sure you want to ask this? Yes, I'm, I want to know. I know <laughs> I can die, right? I just want to know, just bring me to the bottom of the whole thing. And now here as well, and the whole year over the course of this year, I try to really face all of those fears and the suffering in itself. But now sometimes it feels like it totally consumes me in a way where I can't not tackle it. It's, it's, it's like it's ever present, it feels like. And since I'm so much more open and sensitive and more aware of what's going on in my body and emotions and just the overall experience that I have, it's really yeah. hard for me to not feel it or to not look at it beforehand like let's say four or five years ago that was my mode of being just press it away you you mentioned you you just jump into another relationship you distract yourself with love with alcohol with parties whatever people use and choose as their distraction um yeah toy that was easy for me then or work is a common one and uh, now it's really hard for me to not to do this i can't actually it's, it feels like i'm lying to myself if i don't listen to this it's mostly bodily symptoms, right? I feel a pressure and itching or something like mostly pressure in the chest, solar plexus or the heart to not go in there. And then if I go in there, it could turn into like a three hour <laughs> long session of feeling emotions, crying and shouting and like all of this, or just a really short one, but it happens constantly. It feels like, so what's the right balance do you feel? That? There's a, a non-dual teacher that I spent some time listening to and reading some of his books called Rupert Spira. Um, and his definition of, I think he would probably say his definition of being absolutely awesomely okay with something, or you may not use that term, is can you imagine being with this experience forever and never wanting it to go? So I don't know whether, I don't know whether it can be also a bit of a, an unhelpful process if you try and work with something too consciously mm -hmm. because I think it sows the seed that it's not okay. It's something that needs to be fixed, right? It's not. Yeah. Yeah. And that's true, but I think it also, uh, these things are so layered. So I, I would, now that I'm more honest with myself and I'm more embodied and integrated with my human experience, I realize that I'm pretty broken. Fragile. That, or, the, yeah, that although I live in a state of calm and a state of well-being, there are so many things that, that I can feel playing out in my experience still that are part of my makeup. I don't know whether they'll ever go. I don't know whether they will just find new vehicles to express themselves. And I think I'm okay with that. That it feels as though that I'm not trying to fix myself anymore. And that actually what, what has come in its place is a sense of self-love, not overtly, just a sense of self-acceptance, maybe it would be a better word. So my mind has changed its script and it now operates from a kinder more compassionate more understanding script that i am fallible that i am fragile that i am human and that i can get hurt and that i can get triggered and that that i'm okay with that that i don't that if i do gone are the days when i present this enlightened persona and now I actually live in a place of realness and if I want to tell somebody to fuck off because they've really upset me then mm -hmm. I will I will feel the emotions around that and I will it will disturb my well-being but at the same time I'm not gonna um, chastise myself over it as well um, obviously I'll, I'll make amends for something that hasn't worked or that I've been unkind but at the same time I won't add to what my experiences are by trying to be better 
controlling. Um, okay. mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, uh, and I think in that lightness, in that sense of well, of looking after yourself and being compassionate to yourself, you are, you just develop a more natural capacity to be loving, to be understanding, to not. If you if you're judging yourself, it's very very hard not to judge the world. Those two are an experience of yourself, and you can't. It's very. It's it's exhausting probably to try and separate your own self judgment from that playing out in your experiences of the world and the people in it. It goes with everything, right? That leads into, in my case, this. I, I need to fix the situation because I'm yeah. still suffering, and then this evolves into I want to fix something outside of my own experience and this translates into I want to fix the world right this so everything is rooted inside of us yeah a lot of activists in the world and at the moment with the, pand the pandemic there's so many conspirators or conspiracy theorists that are fueled very often by a sense of feeling better about themselves and that's very simplistic But I think a lot of our distractions in life, a lot of our campaigns and our well-being in life may also serve to placate our sense of ourself, uh, the, the state of well-being. And, and so the ego is an amazing, an amazing animal. <laughs> and um, it is, it, it just, because it is part of ourself, we're not separate from the ego. We're not egoless, and we never will be. Um, because of all of those things, it is constantly reinventing itself. I once um, read Ramana Maharshi, I think, actually said this, not to me personally. He died in 1950. But, <laughs> but uh, in one of the books, it was written that he said, the ego is like a caterpillar. It moves along with life um, before it it lets go of one thing, it will attach itself to something else. I think that's a great analogy. It really gives you a very clear picture of, of how elusive the idea of managing your ego is because um, life's not like that. <laughs> Such a sneaky little bitch sometimes. <laughs> it's, it's a green, furry, fuzzy, very... Yeah. Big leg. <laughs> when when you're never, you're not expecting it, it comes back in the back door entrance. Oh, right? it does, so it true. does. Which is why you've got to treat it with, with uh, humility and with humor. <laughs> because, um, it, yeah, it's, it, you're never gonna get it. You're never gonna get it, and that's the fun <laughs> of living. Yeah. Is the, <laughs> is the, the fact that we, uh, we're not perfect, and when we realize that 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 is perfect, then that's where the the real sweet spot in life is, I think. That is it. And does... I'll, this... I'll let you know when I get there. <laughs> yes, please, Mr. Suffering. Um, yeah. Your doctor of suffering. Um, <laughs> doctor. <laughs> the experience that one can have on a psychedelic like ayahuasca or yes. LSD or mushrooms is this potential experience of a, of a deflated ego potentially got leading up to like this ego death quote unquote experience, right? Where you just don't have this identification with it anymore for a short oh, period of time. I, great question. Um, yeah. Well, and this just, just to finish that off is this for, for me, that is just this, a little sneak peek into what can be, but then the understanding of, okay, you coming back to day to day life. And then you have to realize that the ego death part It's not something that you, you're going to have and you're going to experience daily, con constantly. It will be there. But just to, to have grasped the idea of how life could be without the identification of all of those ego things and then being okay with it coming back and losing a little bit the, the, the intensity of that identification, I think that helps me personally at least a lot with this. What you, what you say is just take it with humility and and treat it with humor, it, it's sometimes really hard if it kicks your butt every day, right? Yeah, yeah, there's a limit to that, isn't there? Um, uh, yeah, I, I guess, yes, it could.
but I don't think it would be. I think it's it's as you've described. It's a is an insight into the a deeper experience of yourself. I, I think ayahuasca and everything that it reveals is is all a reflection of yourself. And I think to put it on a pedestal and imagine it's going to be the answer to your to your search for happiness, which is ultimately what we're all searching for in life. Mm-hmm. The sense of fullness, the sense of I'm okay as myself. And you, we get that in all sorts of ways, in material success, in uh, distractions, in, uh, in love. And I, so ayahuasca, I think, really can provide that Yes, it can provide that free experience of ourselves where the ego is not overly active. Not in the driver's seat. I still, th- yeah, yeah, that beautifully said is not in the driver's seat. So I think it's still very much part of the equation, and I think you you are still navigating the experience of ayahuasca th- with the involvement of the ego, whether that's in the ceremony, probably not. To, to, as much it's definitely I, I my ceremonies were very different my my ceremonies were about puking up serpents and <laughs> um and the the bed that i was on being shifted across the room sideways in my experience and so yeah i was removing deep deep trauma and and when i watched the video today that uh, one of the videos i i really hadn't remembered much about the ceremony but looking back it was really traumatic being in it but but it was releasing so much trauma so I think I came from it in a different way and I don't think I was looking to work with my ego I was just looking to work with those blocked traumas that I couldn't access which is what I explained earlier but I know that some people in the the jungle in the, the retreat we were on definitely experienced the death of the ego but i think it's a symbolic thing and i, I it, yes it brings a very different reality to your experience of life but i wouldn't imagine that that is something that in and other than in very few people is entirely maintained and unshakable so i think life steps back in and we relate to other people unless you'd want to live as a hermit uh-huh. in an ayahuasca retreat <laughs> no, I think you will always yeah, the, you, the case right and if the, the timothy Leary and, and ram das the early pioneers of that psychedelic yeah. wave when they <laughs> you interview one one of them ram das said when they had an experience of three weeks of taking lsd every four hours for two weeks in a row. And then eventually he said to the audience said, and guess what? We still came down. It's, it's <laughs> always the same thing, right? Okay, now oh. come back and integrate what you learned to this real life experience. But for, yeah. me, for me, these are, if you have never experienced this and you have, you listen to a podcast like this and you, you, you hear words like ego, ego, death, identification with what is, what is not, and you, you just know that you're suffering because you feel something is not right. And then yeah. you have no idea how to release that. And no one can help you with it because no doctor can tell you what it is. It's all in your mind. Right? It's all your concepts and your stories you tell yourself and could be in a childhood, yeah. could be something else, could be your worries of the future, whatever it is. But in such a ceremony context where you have this one-time experience maybe where you then have a glimpse of how it could feel like without suffering if the ego is just shut off and everything is, is perfectly fine the way it is. And you got shown that all of your life's suffering was part of the equation for you to be that person in that moment. Everything yes. gets integrated and accepted in a way, which, which was in my sermons, a lot of the, the time was the case that I saw everything that I felt was something that hurt me was a gift, right? In that moment was like, it had to happen and this led to the next thing and then you know looking backwards connecting the dots made so much sense and then the whole just so much gratitude for the overall experience of life came in but you can't imagine this just by reading a book and not meditating and just listening to someone talk you have to experience it firsthand 
happen. Yeah, yeah, I totally, totally see that. You, um, it gives you another possibility. And I think life, we, we live in this very uh, hamster-like mental world where the, the wheels of our mind continue in a way that they know to continue. They're really a, a beautiful servant of what they believe and what they imagine we want because it's what we've been most reactive to. And so when we live in a world of suffering or we become over-consumed by our, um, the negative actions of the mind, whether that's through mental health, through our outlook on life, our pessimisticness, or um, anything that our mind either reduces our sense of well-being or acts as a, some sort of a, a quiet negative voice in some way, then that is a, a, a very self-fulfilling experience. And mm-hmm. so ayahuasca definitely, definitely can give you the clear understanding that you are not your thoughts and you are not your identity that your mind has created. You're not entirely that. And so it gives you the possibility to be it differently. And that is huge. That is, without doubt, has the capacity to change for our entire life so that we're then navigating and processing our suffering <laughs> from a conscious place. But, and, and that, it depends. I, I, I don't really talk much about karma and reincarnation, but you can see how the Indian belief system is, has created that because... It doesn't make a lot of sense why some people spend an entire life deep in suffering and never come out of it. And other people wake up from it and begin to live a different relationship with it and a different way of living just in a moment. That the writing, the destiny of life, you can totally understand how the Indian philosophy makes clear sense of life when you when you start to see life from the kinder more connected side of it yes well put mr suffering (laughs) (laughs) i can't believe i'm talking so much (laughs) i do i do Um, (laughs) but that's a perfect closing of that first interview i think um with the last question that i always ask is if you had the chance to give yourself one recommendation before your first ayahuasca ceremony what would that be oh goodness um you mean other than don't do it (laughs) (laughs) um be ready for the snakes (laughs) yeah uh, it really did feel like my whole mouth was uh, expanding to to release this gigantic <laughs> serpent that was my yeah it was freaky as anything um i don't know alex i really don't know what would i advise myself uh, i don't think i would want to to be honest i think if i had any better understanding of it or any different uh, approach to it I wouldn't be I wouldn't have been influenced the way that I was Um, so I think even though it was brutal and even though I'm not sure I would do it again for me personally (laughs) I I think it was perfect and so yeah there's a lot of great gratitude and gratefulness and I think I don't know whether I honoured it properly afterwards, and I think that might be um, something that I would do differently perhaps afterwards, Mm. is realise how sacred and, of course, you you probably remember I banged my head the day after we came out of the the retreat in Iowa, in um, Iquitos, and and after everybody had left the town, apart from a couple of people, I started uh, tripping one night, and that was a really... 
um, freaky experience in the middle of a Peruvian hospital. So I, yeah, I think it would be like, this is serious shit. <laughs> you really need to honor the work that's been done. And, and it wasn't intentional and I didn't mean to bang my head, but uh, maybe that reflected some, something that was going on in my psyche mm. at the time that didn't truly value it. I don't know. I, I didn't feel like that. I did feel like something pretty significant had shifted towards the end of the retreat. Hmm. Um, and I still feel as though it's working. No, I, I still feel as though no. it's playing its magic and the seed that was sown in me has at times been quite challenging. And I've had uh, lots of life changes since I came out of the jungle. Um, lots of things that have been have crumbled. And it actually feels as though so many things in my life are falling apart and clearing away to the point that I'm almost living a life without anything. Monetary, I'm living with family, um, I'm not working. All of those things feel as though, and those things feel as though they're, they're kind of out of reach in many ways. And I think ayahuasca is the means by which that life has started to unravel those things that are not authentically and, and truly honoring me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I was aware that that was the case before I traveled to America and then down to Peru, but that was the journey. I had this huge heart opening uh, probably July or August last year. And I knew that I couldn't fit in my, and these things are so layered and I, kind of experienced this before in the past and I, I just was very very aware that I'd woken to something in me that couldn't be contained in the life that I had so the next morning I I gave up my job and I knew that I was going to go off and live a life that that spoke to my my heart and and I I, th I think in many ways although I've been living a very loving life since the jungle that has got lost a little bit and I'm probably coming back to the place where I'm being invited to live that life again. Mm -hmm. I have no idea how it will look, but yeah, I think, I think it's very simply to honor the sacredness. sacredness. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. The sacredness of the modality that we found ourselves in. That's a good one. That's a definite good one. And the fatigue and your energy blockages, did they shift? Um, yeah, it, it's, I think it's a gradual thing. But yeah, I, I, I generally, I get tired, but I don't, it's not the same as it used to be. It's not, it's not defining and it's not, um, before it used to feel as though I was completely empty, as though mm -hmm. there was absolutely no, so with fatigue, you basically can do things and then you, your body doesn't replenish itself. So it, it doesn't work in, as effectively. And then mm -hmm. things start to get neglected because your body's trying to give you energy. So you don't sleep as well and all sorts of things. So it's really your body's starting to work, starting to be dysfunctional. And so I, I get tired because I, try, I kind of push myself um, to my envelope a little bit more but it's not the same thing at all so yeah i would say it's significantly shifted so i can go for five mile walks pretty much most days and and feel it in my legs a little bit and need to do some things to to help and sports old sports injuries and stuff like that but yeah on the whole i've been cycling most of the summer so yeah it's it's I'm doing things that I haven't done for quite a few years. So yeah, I'd say it was a, it was a definite success. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Yeah. Not, ju not just puking snakes. You took something out of it. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was very symbolic that it, yep. it, um, it represents the under the unconscious, I suppose, doesn't it? The, 
Peruvians have the three levels of consciousness, don't they? The, mm-hmm. uh, um, the anaconda, the, <laughs> I obviously, I really know this stuff. <laughs> so you've got the, you've got the, the jaguar, 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 you've got the snake and you've got mm-hmm. the bird, haven't you? And they're different levels of our consciousness, which is beautiful. I think that really uh, is very Jungian. I can't yeah. say the word. Yeah, mm-hmm. Carl Jung and its deep understanding of the conscious and the subconscious. Amazing. Jack, thank you so much for sharing. Oh, it's been a pleasure. It's been, been really lovely to connect with you again. That's so true. And I hope, well, your wise words are always wanted and you have so much to share, especially on the topic of suffering. <laughs> As you self proclaimed <laughs> master of suffering. Oh, I, I think I might withdraw that, that tag. <laughs> that would be the title of the Doesn't, podcast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> master, master of suffering, suffering talks. My goodness me. Um, what drivel comes out of my mouth <laughs> <laughs> and um, well potentially there will be more more topics to talk about and share in the future so thank you so much for this one and i look forward oh, to any, any other conversation we might have